Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 157, Thought It Was Tuesday, When Sales Take Over Your Life. Shockingly, we made it here tonight, but who are we? I'm Sean, and with me, Mo, the Tabletop Bellhop. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Now, seeing as I didn't even realize we were recording a podcast tonight when I got up in the afternoon and got to work, uh, you're going to have to just deal with what you get tonight, which will involve an AMA with our chat room after our usual fan feedback and some announcements. Now, I do think Sean got in some digital gaming in at least, so we do have some thoughts on Rogue Book, if nothing else, for our Bell Hops tabletop segment. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folks. It seems our topic of snack at the game table was a popular one. We got quite a few comments on YouTube, the blog, and social media. Here are some highlights. Bob Le Deep fried wonton are always popular, but it's several hours of prep and cook for very little snack time. They go fast. Store-bought lumpia are good, too, but you're still spending time deep frying them. I like potato chips and onion dip, the old Lipton soup mix with sour cream. Well, thanks, Bob. I uh, got to say that's way more work than I'm usually willing to do uh, for a game night. No deep frying for things. But again, to me, this sounds like the kind of thing you want to do. Excuse me. The kind of thing you want to do before the game starts or during a scheduled snack break. These aren't the kind of foods that I think I'd want out on the table. Deep fried, greasy things in the middle of playing a game. And while dips are bad. No, dips, dips, I, like, I'm a dip fan, but not on game night. Akia, 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 not even sure how to pronounce that one. Akia one? <laughs> I enjoyed listening and watching you guys talk about game snacks. My favorite snack is popcorn. That was someone's username on yeah. YouTube. So right. Akia one, Acia, we're probably totally missing something. Yep. Like I see one cat or something. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> thank you for the comment, even if we can't pronounce your username. I say mo popcorn can be a great choice, though it really de does depend on what you put on it. Uh, we talked about the smart food the other day. The more stuff you put on it, the more sticky it gets or the more buttery the worse it is for game night. But if you're fine with just plain popcorn, that's a fantastic snack. Easy to wipe up and doesn't leave really any residue. Yeah, but the, even just the oily butter starts to get bad in a, in a real hurry. Now, Kat writes, anything is a snack if you try hard enough or if you cut it up enough. <laughs> well, true. I got to say, not everything makes for a good game night snack. All right, well, Don Ball, chat, uh, chat man, is, I really like the idea of the group eating a meal together before starting to play. See, Don agrees. This is the way it should be done, if at all possible. Uh, to quote the Mandalorian, right? This is the way. Eating first has the advantage of also giving everyone some time to be social and talk about what's up, what's happened since the last got together, whatever's going on with the COVID and the pandemic lately, and get all that talk about non-gaming things out of the way so that once you do put the game out on the table, everyone can then focus on the game. Sorry, uh, Good Games Publishing just <laughs> posted something. Uh, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. Some reminders before we move on to the rest of the show. So our roll camera giveaway ended last week. And we have a winner. Drum roll, please. The name is Ethan L. from the U.S., whose winning entry was a bonus entry based on the fact that Ethan is awesome enough to subscribe to our weekly newsletter. Thanks, Ethan, and congratulations. We'll try to get that out, I'm hoping, next week. We are just recovering from all the Black Friday and Cyber Monday stuff right now. So we got to make a trip out to the post office to get that out to you. Now, speaking of giveaways, we still have two Steam codes for the Guild of Dungeoneering Ultimate Edition up for grabs. You've got one week left to enter for a copy of this tile-laying dungeon and guild hall building digital game. 
Head over to the blog, mouse over tabletop gaming deals, and click on giveaways to see all of our current and recent giveaways, including this one. And finally, I invite you to check out and vote for some really cool role-playing games written in under 24 hours, including one entry from me this year. Head over to the RPG Geek forums to download the 12 entries and get back to Rob with six Bs with your vote. Links, as usual, will be in the show notes. We're normally here to answer your game gaming or game night questions. So you might not have thought so if you listened to our last episode. So going into the holiday sales season, Sean and Deanna both tried to convince me to cancel our usual podcast recording so that we could focus on the deals. And I'll admit it, they were right. In my head, though, I was thinking about it and I'm like, you know what? Last week, right? So last Wednesday. They're like, it's Wednesday. It's a day before American Thanksgiving. The big sales don't tend to hit until actual Thanksgiving day, most on Friday, unless they're live already, right? So people either launch them on like November 1st or a couple weeks before, or they wait till Thanksgiving at like 6 p.m. or the later. So I kind of figured Wednesday wouldn't be that big a deal. And I'm like, oh, you know what? Wednesday will be fine. I can record. We won't be that busy. And then this week, I was like, well, by Wednesday, Cyber Monday is done. That's like two days ago. And we should know about any Cyber Week sales or any sales that are still going. And we should have no problem getting ready for an episode this week. But dear listener, as you will have already likely assumed, (laughs) this was not the case. Now, what I didn't count on is how exhausted we would be and how messed up our sleep schedules would get. Uh, With Amazon sales hitting at 3 a.m. Eastern every night, And making sure we are up and ready to go at that time every day for the last week or so has really taken its toll. And I do apologize for that. But hey, you folks obviously like hearing our voices, so more is better, right? Uh, right? Right. Even if mine sounds like I might be falling asleep, the the coffee is fueling it right now. So I'm I'm doing pretty good. I probably should have got a refill. Now, I will say on a positive note, so far it was all worth it. Um, This is our busiest time of the year for a reason, as most of our income still does come from affiliate links. Would love some more Patreon patrons and other support and sponsorships to offset that. But for now, we're still mostly on Amazon, or not Amazon, affiliates is, is what pays the bills and keeps us happy. So I will say that we did a good job promoting them this year. In addition to record sales on Amazon compared to last year, we managed to get, um, we're now affiliates with a couple more companies like the Op and Haba, as well as Unidragon, which makes some really cool puzzles, as well as some other sites. And we saw sales on all of those. Like we could see it every day, right? We're like, oh, cool. We actually got sales on the Op and Haba. So it wasn't a waste or effort. In addition, whoa, we smashed stuff. In addition, we also had some record number of views on the blog when compared to the same time last year. So all this exhaustion seems like it was worth it, though I'm still not sure I should be here recording now and not either sharing more deals and keeping up with what's still live or unboxing some games and getting content ready because that's the one thing that has fallen behind. All we've done since last week is record another podcast or getting playing games, relaxing, maybe going to play Wii, finally uh, trying out the new Animal Crossing thing, maybe sleeping. Sleeping probably would have been good. Probably and due to, the fact, due to the fact that there was little to no time to actually prep for this episode, <laughs> we decided that we would take an easy way out tonight and just host an AMA where we will answer questions from the awesome folk here live in our chat room. Yeah, we wanted to be here for you and record something. So at this point, I think next November, we are probably going to take at least a couple weeks off, if not the entire month. There are plenty of shows that take whole months or more off. So I don't think that a short break is a deal breaker for us, especially not if we can have some content to dribble out on YouTube. Yeah, though that's something we didn't do this year. We managed to go live, but we didn't really put anything else. See, Deanna's saying that's what we said last year. Last year, we took three weeks off. We took a full three weeks off last year. Yeah, now, we're sick. <laughs> yeah, we still took three weeks off. <laughs> now, as usual, for one of these AMA shows, for those of you awesome lobbyists here in our chat room on Twitch, feel free to ask anything gaming or non-gaming related. You can ask me, you can ask Sean, you can ask both of us. It doesn't really matter. Now, to give everyone in the chat room some time to think and come up with some questions, 
I do have one topic, one thing I want to talk about to get us started. Now, our good friend Dyson Logos, uh, Canadian map maker extraordinaire, the Hatchmaster, has decided to launch his own gaming prompt thing. Like, you know, like um, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the I don't want to name the one that we shouldn't name anymore. Yeah, they changed uh, they changed that because no one talks about calls it that anymore. Yeah, and I can't remember what they changed it to, but you know, like like the every day of the week you do there was RPG a day, I know was one of them. And some of the other ones that have been done where it's just, you know, a, a prompt every day to do something in the month of December. And the one he's done is he is calling it Dice Ember instead of December. D-I-C-E. So Dice Ember. So with one E. So Dice Ember for this month. Now, in Dyson's own words, the hashtag December 2021 challenge is to produce something dicey RPG dice game related each day of December and release it with the December hashtag or December 2021 tag. This can be a blog or social media post, a drawing of something RPG related, a drawing or photograph of actual dice, a random table or die drop table for us to chuck dice on, etc. The field is wide open. Make it dice related, and honestly, decide for yourself whether you're following the prompts or doing your own thing. We're cool with it either way. Dice on. So you can find the prompts and more info at www.dysonlogos, that's D Y S O N L O G O S, one word, dot com forward slash December, D I C E M B E R. So what I thought we would do to start things off, well, everyone in the chat room can start firing off questions for us to answer after this, is start, do the first prompt. Now, I doubt we're going to take part in December every day. Uh, I don't think we'll do more than the one prompt, but maybe on our Sunday, um, if we start getting back to our Sunday brunch, which we should, uh, maybe we'll do a few of these on Sundays or do a week's worth on Sundays. So I don't know how mel how well I'd be able to tie them in the dice without like taking pictures of dice or <laughs> chucking some dice to do something. But as as a podcast topic, we'll see how they go. So the number one right now is ammo. Now, Sean, supers must have ammo rules. Like uh, all all the supers games you've read, they're modern, right? No modern game doesn't have guns. There's got to be some kind of ammo rules in supers. Well, games. you know what. Here we go. So we're going to go with the Mutant and Masterminds Deluxe Rulebook, right? The crunchiest superhero book out there. Okay. Don't use ammo unless it's narratively important. Done. That's it. Nice. That's it. Uh, that I went through a stack of superhero books. Not one of them mentions the use of, the tracking of, or anything of ammo. Wow, it was I'm actually, actually kind of surprised. It was actually kind of relieving. Uh, <laughs> it was nice. Nobody cared. I actually had to go back to the my old Warhammer fantasy book to start looking at, at actual stuff of ammo. And even that doesn't talk too much. It talks about what, what, what ammo is being used, but it doesn't yeah. even really talk about tracking your ammo or you know anything like that. Uh, the closest it's got is it's got a D8 roll if you throw anything explosive. The, yep. which gives you your cardinal directions for which way it's exploding in when things go boom. I'm starting to shocked at the superhero RPGs, like even the crunchy ones. Yeah, no, didn't they're, have they're tracking of ammo. No. Who, what, what happens if someone plays the Punisher? Come on. You reload off screen. Yeah. Unless it's narratively important. Yeah. Superheroes don't deal with ammo. That's just, that, that's, that's, that's a superhero trope, right? That's a, you yeah. know, unlimited, unlimited ammo. You're reloading off screen. That is kind of interesting. So, <laughs> so one of my favorite rules, so so overall, tracking ammo, it all depends if you should do it or not on the system you're running it. If your game is about scarcity and survival with resource management being an important part of it, ammo matters, right? If you're doing a Walking Dead zombie game, post-apocalyptic or Dark Sun in D&D, that's when I think that really matters. When having ammo, all that matters is that your character stops at the store now and then to stock up. I really don't think it matters. Yeah, I'm just randomly, I realized Hack the Planet, which is forged in the dark, may yep. have, oh, may have an ammo rule. I don't, I, I totally forgotten about uh, So that. now the topic is dice as well. So what I mm -hmm. wanted to mention is one of my favorite ammo systems is a die-based one 
where you roll a die, and I've seen it done different ways. So one of the ways is when you roll your damage die, if you low roll the lowest possible result, actually I've seen it highest possible result too, you're then out of ammo for your next shot. So you get that shot off, and if you roll a one out of on your D10 for damage, or if you roll a 10, depending on the system, you're now out of ammo. And in most of those games, you then have to either tick off an ammo box or spend some kind of action to, to, to reload. So it gives you a little pause in the combat. So there's always that chance. And then the silly part about that, where I don't like, is the damage on the gun sets how frequent you might run out of ammo, which may or may not work. Like if that takes some design work to make that seem semi realistic. I, I think one of my favorite things when I was going through the old Warhammer rules that I'd forgotten about is you are allowed to walk around with loaded bows or crossbows yep. without penalty. Yeah, In fact, that's, it's that's an, an easy advantage. thing to do. You're expected to <laughs> declare that you are walking around with your missile weapons reloaded in order to save yourself a round of combat. <laughs> that just i, I gotta assume that doesn't mean drawn bow you've just like got the arrow in your I, hand you're ready yes, to go but still who's walking down a path with an arrow knocked and ready yeah uh, not to mention that crossbows aren't exactly the most reliable weapons in the world and you're more well, than likely yeah. to kill a oh, one of your uh co-conspirators so the other system that i like a little bit better than this is where you roll an ammo die in addition to shooting so you roll your damage as normal, but there's an additional ammo die of some type. And if it comes up with a set number, then you have to reload or you have to spend an ammo. Um, I really dig that better because then it's the, the odds are, are, you can change the odds better, right? So you don't have it that because your pistol does D6 damage, it's going to run out of ammo more often than your machine gun that does 10. Although those particular ones probably do make sense. But <laughs> maybe you roll D100 or something. So I kind of dig that. And dice-based ammo, I've always liked the random chance you will run out of ammo. As a DM, I think that mixes your simulationist with your narrative because you never know if you're going to run out and it can happen at dramatic moments. So you get that narrative story, oh my God, I'm out of ammo and I wasn't expecting it without having to go for, and you still get the simulationist that you do run out of ammo. You don't just have infinite amounts without getting into the, excel tracking yeah it's except it's interesting though because uh depending on the character and again this is going to depend a lot on what your character is and who your character is um there are a number of characters and 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 personality types that know how many bullets are in their gun yeah and know how many times they shot right Mm -hmm. you've got the the deadpool scene on the on the expressway right where he's counting Mm -hmm. off the shots as he goes and he knows exactly how many bullets he's got and that's you know even in a massive gunfight, that's reasonably expected. So running out yeah. of ammo, now you can have a jam. That's a different thing. So if you're, yeah, if you're they're considering the a same, jam, yeah. that's one thing. But running out of ammo, I mean, unless you're wild firing or you are specifically the kind who outright doesn't care. You know, I, I am. Right. I, I declare that I am not paying attention to my <laughs> ammo. Um, it's, it's pretty hard. I mean, like, you know, if you've got a revolver, you've got six shots, right? If you've yeah. got a, uh, you know... A, a, a normal magazine on a nine millimeter, you're going to have like 10 or 12 shots. If you've got a shotgun, you may, may only have two, uh, yeah. you know, one per barrel. You have to reload every time. And, and, you know, things like that become easier. So at that point, it's kind of weird to use the dice and, and it really almost needs to be again, in some ways, these superhero games are doing it right. If yeah. it's narratively important mm-hmm. to have run to run out of ammo, run out of ammo or, or, or have, or have the option to run out of ammo then. Right. You know, maybe, you know, roll the dice if it's narratively important, but rolling yeah. every time you take a shot. Yeah. I, it's one of those, it's, it's a, it's the, the, you're probably, it, it's four people who do what I do. And I tend to encourage everyone to do where you roll your attack roll and your damage roll at once. Right. So you're rolling everything at once. You're why not throw another die in there? Right. If you're already doing that, it's not going to hurt. It's that way you need that extra die to know if you missed right the other one i do like with the the system where your damage roll you only actually can run out of ammo after you hit which i think is a good way to do it for um for a game because it it, you're getting your reward you hit you did damage but now you're out so as opposed to your gun jams you get nothing in our chat uh red ketchup fbi has just posted a link to bullet dice on etsy and these would be a great way to track ammo on like an old western 
yeah. as, as like an old Western thing, either or either track it or you or roll to jam or whatever. But if right. I was playing a Western game, I would love to have these little, you know, dice bullet nice. bullet dice. They're nice. Thanks for that link, uh oh, red, thanks, ketchup. red ketchup FBI. All right. Uh, so next up, we have a couple of chats. Uh, well, we'll get, you know what? We do have one question in the chat, so we'll go to that first. Pax, okay. Pax has joined us in the chat and asked uh, for an inside peek at the deals factory. Uh, now, you mentioned having to get up early. What is it you mm. use to find and track deals uh, on the site? They were impressed to see these stealth unadvertised deals that only show up when you add to cart. How do you go about finding those? Uh, they don't want to give they don't want you to give away your trade secrets. But, you know, I I think a lot of people don't understand how much effort you indeed put into these sales. So the one thing I will not be doing is giving away the trade secrets (laughs) because that's the value add that we know how to do this. So I have been doing the deal sharing thing since I started at TDS, like years. But and and as something that we did as like extra income and at, at the time what it was was Deanna was like, all right, we, we don't have enough money for groceries. You got to stop buying games, basically. And I'm like, well, how about we have a rule where anything I make from gaming gets reinvested into more games? And then when, it, so if I sold the game, that money went into the gaming budget. And well, that's when I started discovering affiliate sales. So I would sit there and share affiliate links just as something to do to make some extra money to uh, fund the the hobby or the addiction as as the case may be this is before i used to get review copies or anything like that right and obviously well before i started doing this as a living so it was something i would do where i get home from work and i'd spend a couple hours and it just gets to be some of it is the fact that you get used to knowing what to look for and the one thing i will say and deanna's already pointed this out in the chat is it is 100 manual we do not use any bots to post anything or to find anything. Now, there are things out there. There's something called an API. I don't even remember what API stands for, but it's when you use code to call info from a different website. And most places that share deals online use an API to pull the deals. The thing is, over the years, we've learned the APIs are terrible. Like besides the fact they will, one of the biggest ones for Amazon in particular is they ignore shipping. So you'll get the sales as 97% off, but then the item has $50 shipping. The other thing APIs miss are any actual sales. So if there's a coupon or a buy two, get one free, the APIs miss that. They also repre- uh, report the percent off based on whatever, whoever inputted some MSRP somewhere down the line, and they're often not right. So most of that just comes from experience. And what it literally is, is Deanna and I going to specific websites and looking for things. Now, I will admit, Deanna knows some search code that she can put in on Amazon to show everything marked 40% off or more, for example. And still, though, it takes a real person to sit there and find out, like to, to notice, to know what's different, what's a wrong MSRP, what's this. Now, there are other sites out there that do provide something. So, for example, the one, I I don't think I'm giving away a secret if I mention Camel, Camel, Camel. Three Times Camel is the biggest site for checking price history on Amazon. And it's what everyone uses. So, anytime you see someone online saying, this is the lowest price ever, according to Camel, Camel, Camel. Again, it makes mistakes. Camel, 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 again, doesn't take into account um, coupons or buy two, get one free or 10% off or any of that. They just give you your basic, like the, the, the things we always say at, and an additional, right? So you'll have like whatever uh, Carcassonne was 44% off. And then there's something that adds an additional. That's that stacking info. That's not there. Now added to that is, um, knowing the MSRPs on games just from doing this, right? The, the experience of having done this for years, um, Deanna mess mainly for the last three years, just getting to know what the MSRPs of games are. And then another trick, and I'll give you this trick right now that, that I don't think is spoiling anything is when you see that something with a dumb price, it's probably a wrong MSRP. When th- something is 1813, you probably are looking at a wrong MSRP on M- Amazon. Now you still have to do the research to find out what the right MSRP is. But then when you see something that's $45.99, it's probably the right MSRP. But when you see $45.28, you're like, well, wait a minute. 
that's kind of weird that's probably not the msrp for this game and you just get used to what price point things are at like small box games are in you know the 15 to 20 range and then your giant ticket to ride games tend to be about 60 bucks and then when you see one of those for only 30 you're like wait a minute why is that only 30 bucks and sometimes it's a deal sometimes it's not um going to multiple different sites doing the research um we spend hours on it it's it's we do not make $15 an hour. We do not make uh, the minimum wage everyone claims everyone should make doing this. Unfortunately, we spend way too much time on it for the, the return, but it does let us do this for a living. So it seems worth it overall. Uh, knockoffs aren't as much of a problem because they are not sharing the same bins anymore in no. the Amazon warehouses. No, no. It, uh, the only problem with that is that it, they've already convinced, everyone's convinced Amazon is doing that. So Amazon stopped. So they, they used to have a process where every copy of 13th Age that comes in gets put on the same pallet in the same spot in the warehouse. And when someone orders a copy of 13th Age, they go to that spot and they take the one off the top. The problem was counterfeiters knew this and were taking advantage of it. So they were selling copies of 13th Age to Amazon at bargain basement prices because they weren't legit. And they were getting mixed in with the legit copies from Pelgrane Press. And that was a huge issue. So that has stopped. Now everything is palleted by source instead of by item. So that should never happen. And if it does happen, it's from a specific seller. And when it happens, you can then report that seller. And the big thing we have told everyone to do is you have to check who is selling the item. In general on Amazon, you probably 99% of the time want sold by and shipped by Amazon. But there are reputable sellers out there. For example, um, uh, one of the big sites, I'm drawing a blank right now. It's not somewhere we have an affiliate for. It's Card House or one of the big ones. Deanna will correct me. One of the big online game stores sells direct through Amazon. And, but their name is something like Wonderful Toys. Like, it's weird. I, like I said, she'll correct me on what it is. So whenever you do, it's Miniature Market. Yes, there you go. So it's Miniature Market, which is, is one of the biggest online game stores. Sells through Amazon, but under a weird name that's not Miniature Market. So the big thing with that is doing research on your third-party sellers. We will not, as, as long as we catch it, we will not share a sale from a third-party seller that doesn't have a 95% feedback rating or better and have enough reviews to make that valid. Similar, like to, 100, yeah, similar to shopping on eBay, right? Yes. If, they, if, if their rating isn't perfect, there are probably some serious red questions. Yeah, one deal outlet Canada, probably not. Sometimes 91, <laughs> but yeah, in general, 95, I don't dig deep. If it's 91, I start looking at reviews and trying yeah. to see what's better. Now, one of the things that I, you know, I've, I've sat down and watched. I don't take part in this affiliate thing. This is, no. this is Mo, and, Mo and D's thing, but I've been there, uh, you know, during some sales or in the mornings when we're all sitting around having their coffee and they're just doing their, their more morning scan through. Uh, and, and you really, you cannot automate the the digging for deals it doesn't work no. as as all these other sites who try to do it programmatically have proven uh yeah you get some stuff but you get wrong stuff and you don't get anywhere near all of it uh what i wish we could afford to do uh is you know if the patrons ever get high enough is hire a a fiverr coder to automate or find a you know find a subscription service or something to automate the sharing of the deals yeah. Because that takes up an inordinate amount of time just sharing oh. to everywhere. I mean, there's a lot of different socials out there, and they, they all need to be represented from Board Game Geek to RPG Geek to Twitter to Facebook to every other social media site that has pl proliferated since the descent of G+. <laughs> Yeah, there are a ton of them. And, we, and there are some we share on, some we don't. And trying to share it is a lot of time. I do use TweetDeck to anim automate the tweets, which I always post something in it, TGD repost uh, for people. Because supposedly there's strange people out there on Twitter who actually like, click on a username and scroll back instead of just showing up to see what's going on. Um, so that's an issue. Uh, another thing that does take a lot of time is generating those affiliate codes. Now, Amazon has this nice thing called a site stripe at the top, and you just click a button to generate a link. But like we are affiliates at, for anyone on our Discord, we have a full list. There's, there's 60 stores roughly that we have affiliates with. But we don't also, we don't just share affiliate deals. There are a couple good sites out there for showing you the lowest price online. 
And often I will look up a game. And then if it's cheaper somewhere we don't have affiliate, I'll still share. It usually has to be a pretty good deal for me to do that. <laughs> uh, if you just check out our Black Friday landing page that's live right now, I 10% of the stores are affiliates, maybe 20% are affiliates, where the rest aren't. Now, the other thing I will also try to do is sometimes, depending on how busy we are, I'll try to interject a little more info. Like, hey, this is our favorite two-player game, or we really dig this one, or something like that. Or, oh, I've never seen it this cheap. That sometimes happens, sometimes doesn't. It's just, it's more time and more work where usually I'd save that for when I'm like, no, that's a good deal. Look at this one. <laughs> and it's a way to kind of highlight them. I know we do not use a, a website or sorry, a, a spreadsheet to track prices ourselves. And honestly, we use Camel Camel. I just know that it's not true. Like I know it's not <laughs> perfect, but it's the easiest way to look up prices. But often people will say this and I just know that this has been cheaper. This has been more like, again, it's experience. It's, We've been doing this now full-time for what, three years now. And I was doing it part-time for way longer, like, like going back like 2002 or whatever. And yes, there is, there is backend secret stuff. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, there's, there's, again, a lot of it really is the fact that it is hand maintained. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, you, you can't avoid that to get all the deals. Um, with, you know, no matter how good your API is, there are definitely things that it's just impossible to find with the stacking of coupons and mm -hmm. two for one combination deals and things like that. Yeah. A lot of it's again, knowledge of the market, knowledge of usual game prices, different publishers, knowing what's Asmodee because Asmodee has something called the map, which is your minimized advertised purchase price, which is the lowest an online store is allowed to advertise they're selling a game for which is why you see so many games that say add to cart to see price, but also why you don't tend to get deals on those big fantasy flight games until they've been out for a while. So it ends up, their, their most recent map actually has like an expiry date that after certain games have been out certain long, it's gone. It used to be all their games across the board, but knowing what games are under the map so that when I open up Amazon and I see um, Mansions of Madness for 22% off, even though we usually don't share anything unless it's 35% off or more, I know that one breaks the map. But it's knowing what games are at Asmodee. We literally downloaded a spreadsheet at one point of a list of all Asmodee games of what's under the map and what's not. Um, we probably should get a new version of that because it's been a while. But that is what we use to see if it's a map breaker. And when it is, I usually like to show that, it, hey, it's a map breaker. And, and D points out that this, and this is important, Amazon doesn't allow their affiliates to list exact prices that unless you know. it's on um like social media because social media is considered ephemeral and temporary right you can't show it on a blog post or an email actually we can't even put affiliate links in our email or else the people who do uh patronize tabletop gaming deals and possibly bellhop we'd be throwing links in there we'd be like oh my god go buy this right now we can't we, that is against the rules and no we can't show the exact percent off or the price Unless it's on that the ephemeral media, the media that it is expected to go out of date on its own. Blog posts, we cannot, unfortunately. I wish we could. Because it is really annoying. I would love to tell you the exact price of every item yep. on sale for Black Friday. It would probably get us more sales. Well, absolutely. And you see people commenting on, you know, well, what's the price? Just and then other people jumping in saying, "Well, you can't, right? It's yeah. a, like the board on the board game geek threads and things like that. Where's the price? And like, well, we're not allowed to do that because yeah. this is a forum. Uh, <laughs> yes, and, and I had people try to accuse us of trying to be shady, that we're just trying to get the clicks. And I'm like, why Why would we do this? A lot why of people don't understand that? affiliate links. Like everyone is 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 angry when they see affiliate links. Yeah, and they don't like, understand oh, why. Um, it, it There's no, they don't understand that affiliate links does not raise the price of anything. No. <laughs> um, it's, it's Amazon paying people to bring advertise for to them. advertise it's 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 an advertising cost for amazon not an extra cost other than every advertising cost is tacked on every price but that's a different issue mm -hmm. um if they weren't advertising through affiliates they'd be advertising some other way it's yeah. not like they wouldn't be spending their advertising budget um so again ad affiliates are paid by the advertising budget not by a markup on 
the price. And I wish more people would understand oh. that basic concept like, because there, there they really is don't. absolute hatred and vitriol for anyone who uses affiliate links. And I don't get it. Yeah. It gets directed at us now and then. And I'm Reddit, like, Reddit and board game geek, especially like a lot of the forum troll people are really, um, yeah, they're really harsh about know. that. I really don't know what it is. Oh, that's a good timing. Nightbot. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of funny. I don't know. I keep thinking it was a scam, but still, yeah, like it's there's no scam. It's advertising budget. We still get it. There was a recent thread on Board Game Geek where someone was like, "You're obfuscating the prices to try to generate clicks," and I'm no. like, "I don't get anything for a click. You just want that cookie." And I'm like, "Okay." And people who go out of their way where I'll share it, and they're like, "Well, here's a non-affiliate link." I'm like, "What? We did the work. Like this takes time." It's not like there's a, like, it, like I get it when there's an Amazon landing page, right? Black Friday, we had to make sure we were value at it. Cause if you just wanted the Black Friday deals on Amazon, all you had to do was click on the Black Friday and click on toys and games. And there it is, right? There, there there's the toys and games. Yeah. So Pac's saying traffic is late, but I'm not giving myself traffic. I'm giving Amazon traffic. It's not a click to our site, right? Yeah. That's what I'm saying with the affiliate link. Clicks to our site. Yes. That's totally different. But I've had people upset that I didn't disclose that the page I'm linking to has affiliate links on it, which you don't have to disclose. You just have to disclose if there's an affiliate link that you're sharing. So I have people who get upset when I'm like, here, go check out our webpage. Like, oh, your webpage has affiliate links. You didn't disclose. I'm like, yes, I did. It's right at the top of the page. Like, yeah, but you didn't disclose here on Facebook that I was going to go to a site that has affiliate links, even though we tell you once you get there. And I'm like, <laughs> why, why are people so yeah, upset it's... about it? Like, like what, what, how are we scamming you? Let, let me, and like, let's point out the fact that this was done on Facebook where you're getting. Yes. There's that too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not even going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to ding myself out there, but uh, if you're on Facebook, you got way bigger things to worry about than going to somebody's page with affiliate link on it. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. People get really upset about it and I don't get it. And and compared to some other places that provide board game deals, I feel ours is much more value added than just pulling a bunch of crap from an API yep. that is you click through half of the links and they don't even match what it showed on the site because it hasn't updated in a week and all the other problems with all of the sites that pull from APIs. I get it. It's 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 sit back and relax income for them. And yep. in some ways I kind of wish we had that. I'd like if if I knew more about coding an API, I'd be tempted to do both, right? I'd have here here are all the deals, and here's our our I would be curated list. Yeah, part of the problem with APIs again is that there's limits to them, right? So you can't you can't just constantly check the API. You can't yes. constantly be hitting it over and over again. Oh, no, it's true. You'll and have it some sort of limit if you yeah. well for free. You're only allowed, I think, it's a thousand pulls a day, right? Which honestly is not not a much. Lot. It really isn't a lot. And you got to think if we have a hundred games on our site, every person that goes there is a hundred pulls. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at, you're down to only a hundred pulls per day people can, for your free thousand. Yeah. But that you, the, the places that use this obviously pay for it and that. Yeah. So I don't know. So this is the other one. Everyone hates Amazon, right? Well, if you hate Amazon, use our links because it takes 3% from Amazon and gives it to us, a gamer. I, I don't get it. I, it makes no sense to me. Why, why is what I do any worse than what many other, like, it's, it's not even like sharing duck cleaning, you know, <laughs> like, like duck cleaning. You don't need that unless you just like put up drywall. You don't need your ducks clean. I used to work in the industry. Trust me. You probably <laughs> unless, don't need Unless you've clean. had renovations. You, there's very, very small, small chance you're going to get any benefit. Yeah. Do change your filter though, because that is why you don't need duck cleaning. At least once every six months. Yeah, I think um, it's more often that, isn't it? I don't know. I change. I think it's every six. quarter. I, I I change it when Nest tells me to nowadays. Yeah. Um, the net my Nest app tells me I need to change. Well, we we actually because we did a lot of service recently on our whole HVAC AC yeah, yeah. heater. We have people come out and check everything, and they replace it when they come out now. So there you go. That's All right. Well, so there is the, the uh, there's the sausage making of a different sort. For this episode, yeah, without, this without, is... without giving away all, all that. Sorry, I don't want to give away the re the deals, but like, if people all knew this, you could all do it yourself, and then we'd make nothing. <laughs> Although at the same time, very few people would be willing to take the effort yes. that it requires like the, 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 to the find the these return signals. on investment. Really, it's it's probably not worth. A lot it. of people have to buy stuff for this to become valuable. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to jump over to the Discord where we had a question from Dave. 
Uh, Dave asks me, actually, what can you tell us about your masks character? So my current masks character is using the bowl playbook and he goes by the name of Ultra Lad. He is your sort of prototypical jock dude, dude, bro, um, a senior in high school. And uh, his parents were actually villains who uh, experimented on him in childhood to give him his powers, uh, which are uh, an incredible strength and a uh, almost total invulnerability, at least of the torso. Um, so I can take the vulnerability bullet. of the torso. Just I, I can, funny. I can take like, bullet I get hits. It, it makes yeah, yeah. sense. It just sounds funny. I can, I can take bullet hits to the, to the chest, but, uh, it'll hurt if you start shooting me in the arms. Uh, and then I'm, you know, incredible super strength and I can't fly, which was actually the, the, the GM was actually like, really, you're going to, you're going to pass on that. I'm like, yeah, I, I need to give myself a little, a little work to do. So, uh, I, I chose not to, not to fly. Um, so that's uh that's that's the the meat and potatoes of my masks character uh this actually my next character is already queued up uh came up this week uh i'll be doing one of the media darlings i forget the actual name of the playbook but they're basically a uh an instagram star sort of thing or a, a star maybe it even is the star um uh, but they're they're a they're a popular character who who sort of vibes okay. on their uh on media popularity uh, and, uh, I want their power to be an EMP so that, you know, when they're being recorded unnecessarily, they can just wipe all the, all the recording media in the area. Nice. So, uh, and then all right. uh, I've got another question from PAX. I want to talk about, I'm just trying to find yeah. it. Yeah, here it is. Okay. I got to move this somewhere. I can read it a little better because I am trying to decide if we do this as a full show when I'm thinking, no. So. The question, I recently listened to episode 58, What's the Problem, from back September 2019. Uh, this was a freeform discussion of problematic content in games. I really enjoyed this break from the usual format where Mo and Sean explored their thoughts on this complicated topic in an open, unscripted conversation. Such a difficult topic in this format allowed for nuance and mixed feelings, which is exactly where most of us are in dealing with problematic stuff in our art media. Hallelujah. Um, I wondered if you might be willing to revisit the topic now a couple of years later. Much has happened in 2020 and 2021 that affects what strikes people as problematic and how we respond to it. Um, copaganda, for example, the glorification or valorization of the police is now something we're a lot more sensitive to. How gender identities are handled is another such topic. And now we're much more aware of problematic creators, such as those who support trans exclusionary radical feminists. Um, how has your experience evolved over the last couple of years? Recognize any emerging issues and handling the games that are affected by them. So my first thought when I read this is I don't think any of our advice would have changed. Not really. Like, no. I don't think anything like, yes, there are new topics and we are going to constantly be introduced to uh thing becoming more aware of what content is problematic and what content creators are problematic but i just I, like i haven't re-listened to the episode but i'm just wondering how much we'd be able to add to that like yeah, I, I, mean, I think it is worth bringing up again but i just can't like our overall result if i remember correctly from that episode was the important thing is to acknowledge it and to be talking about it and to sit down with your group and decide what content you will allow and not allow at your game. And Absolutely. I don't think that's changed. Yeah, I mean, Lines and Veils, um, the concept of Lines and Veils and, and the X card don't change. The only thing that changes is what's listed in them. And so right. maybe now we have uh, police, you know, or, or, or popular police or good guy police listed in our Lines and Veils chart where we didn't yes. before. Uh, and you know, maybe JK Rowling is now listed in our, our lines and veils chart, uh, or Harry Potter content as a result of her, the well, authors. I think, I think uh, we've already <laughs> talked about that yeah, one yeah. quite a bit. And I mean, that's, yes. you know, but all these new topics come up, but they are at this point able to be inserted into the existing safety tools and safety framework, uh, that exists just naturally. But it just flows right into this framework that we have developed as an industry. Not Mo and I have not developed any of it. 
Uh, I, actually, I made one for, for kids playing board games, but I never actually went anywhere with it. I created that and I never actually put it out. That's actually still in my drafts. I, I kind of forgot about that. I had made a, a stop sign for playing board games with kids. Right. And well, with the family. But yeah, so again, the frameworks are there. Uh, and when new problems arise and when new discoveries arise, uh, they can be inserted into there. And that goes for problematic content creators, uh, authors, and, uh, you know, people who are, are outed. Uh, See, the, the only thing I don't think we address is if that comes up in the middle of playing a game. I think well, again, that'd be we the did only talk thing about, we could probably talk we did, about. We did talk about uh, revisiting session zero. Yes. Right? It's not it's not only session zero. It starts at session zero, but it needs to continue right. and be revisited. Yeah, so, like I said, that's what I was going to add is if you suddenly find out the game you are playing is published by someone who abused their staff, you may want to sit down with your group and say, hey, do we want to continue playing this? Now, in general, I think you probably don't have to stop playing what you're playing as long as you're having fun because you started playing with good intentions and didn't realize this. Now, the decision I would probably make at that point is, sure, we're going to keep playing, but we're no longer going to support that person. So after this campaign's done, we're done, or I'm no longer going to buy the new books or whatever for the game. Yeah, where, you know, look, we'll look for third-party content that doesn't support yes. them, however you want to go about it. Uh, if you've already bought the books, you've already, exactly. they already have your money. There's, you know, maybe don't put, maybe don't post about it on social media or maybe choose not well, that's to make the other it thing too, an actual what play. You, what you do have to watch for, and this is something I'm finding difficult, is um, endorsing intentionally or unintentionally, yeah. right? Like I, I'm trying to say, if I, if I sit down and play Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle with my kids, should I be sharing pictures on Instagram? And at this point, it's questionable. I mean, right now it's weird because a lot of things are going ahead about Harry Potter because of the anniversary happening this year of 20 years since the movie release. Uh, but they are all, they are exclusively, they are excluding JK Rowling's. Yes. Um, there is a TBS show uh, on Sundays. La last week was the first episode and it is the Hogwarts house battle. And it's a mm -hmm. game show hosted by Helen Mirren. Um, and they are very clearly putting their foot down with, lgbtq uh t mm -hmm. plus contestants on this show right um so and and they have not once mentioned in the first episode anyway they did not once mention the author right um and i know for instance uh, hbo is putting on a a big talk show with characters from the movie again because this is you know 20th anniversary of the movie and she was explicitly not invited uh, to the HBO pro uh, program. Mm -hmm. So there but are to choices be honest, being made. I don't know what the op is doing with JK Rowling anymore. Uh, as well, far absolutely. as that particular game is concerned. Absolutely. There I mean, you know, because again, the the potions expansion came out after we knew. <laughs> yes. There was no there really wasn't any question about her stance on things when that expansion came out. Yeah. Which I still haven't even recorded. Oh I think we did do the unboxing. Then I think but I haven't done any more because of that. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, I, again, I just, I can't see writing up another blog post. I can't see doing a full topic. Like I think we just talked about some of the stuff. Yeah. Some of the new stuff that's come up since then. Um, I can't remember if Black Lives Matter had happened, but the whole George Floyd and everything that came with that, the uh, ACAB without saying it out loud, um, didn't blue line. There are definitely new issues and that's going to keep happening. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great thing. Like I, the, Stuff like this is going to happen. We're going to hear about Broken Token. We're going to hear about CEOs of Activision. We're going to hear about Blizzard issues. More people, as more people come forward, we're going to become more aware of this content. And again, I think the important thing is being aware of it, talking about it, and making an informed decision on what you do and don't want to support and how you support it. And again, I'm not telling you, do support, don't. That's up to you. That's you and your group, your game night. You do you but at least be aware that these things are happening. And, and I, another interesting thing that, that I think is worth talking about is, uh, again, when, when it comes to the revisiting, don't just revisit new things. Uh, for instance, mm. there was yet again a school shooting yesterday. Yep. Yep. Um, right across the river. Yeah, real nearby. Um, and this, you know, someone who reloaded their weapon. So, huh, and and 
this keeps happening. Is this something, you know, is there something you can do or you want to do in your games uh, to minimize the importance of gun violence in a game, right? There are, there are ways that you can, can act and talk in your systems that you may wish to, to go into a direction where gun violence is minimized and, and you know, mm-hmm. the, the importance of a gun is minimized. Uh, just to support the overall shift or potential shift or lack of shift, whichever you want to call it, in the in the view on what is happening in the world. And that's something that that has been going on for ages. And maybe at one point you decided it was okay, but you finally had enough. Yeah. And and that changes, right? So your lines and veils can change and don't be afraid to change them as you as a person mm-hmm. evolve. Yeah, that's something like like <laughs> As the game starts, this is something we haven't really talked about, but it's like hour zero, right? Like before your game starts, if something has happened in the media, in the world, something big happened and it's impacting you, let the other players know, right? Like, like uh, honestly, we're getting to that point. We, we uh, Session zero is becoming a little more mainstream and talking about your feelings and what you want from a game is becoming more mainstream. But I don't think, and, and I think it's going to keep evolving and maybe get to that point where, hey, tonight, you know, there, this just happened. Whatever. There's an outbreak at my kid's school. Can you know? I know you've got the the whole mutagen side plot going on. Can we step off that for now? Can we do a side quest? Can we just do something else? It's a little too close to home for tonight. And normalizing that conversation before games, I think, is is a huge thing that that, that is going to keep changing and keep happening. And yes, there's going to be people out there saying, "What do I have to sign a consent form when I sit down?" at your table and like yes actually you do because we want everyone to have fun yep. not just you absolutely yeah or not I'm, just I'm, me i'm fine i'm fine with consent forms i'm okay with that essentially a line and veil uh sheet is a consent form uh yeah. you know we don't generally have them signed but i got no problem putting a signature line on there um not at all <laughs> we yeah. actually uh we actually just got into some content into our uh current masks game where we started dealing with some drugs um superpower enhancing drugs and we paused and the dm took a, this took cool? the dm took a minute and said look i just want to remind everyone we've got the x card in here this is great you know this we're going in this direction and things may, may become uncomfortable i want to make sure that everyone is going to be okay here mm-hmm. uh and i pope and i pop, piped up and said uh, because of my involvement in the plot line it's like look that doesn't mean that it's only you. If you see me doing something with an NPC that you're uncomfortable about, stop me. Don't mm-hmm. just stop you. Like don't if it's don't just worry about your character, worry about the story as a whole. So if I'm going too far for you, yeah. I still have to stop. <laughs> just because I'm doing it doesn't mean you don't have to you, you don't have the right to stop me. Yeah. Uh, so uh and that's you know, it literally that was, you know, sun, my on Sunday we had this conversation with the whole group. And we've been playing for quite some time. <laughs> oh, and that's the kind of thing, like I said, it should be normalized. It should happen more often. And then Math yeah. Guy Dave makes a good point. If they don't want to sign, I don't want to play with them. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, and sometimes it, it's still not necessarily easy to have those conversations, but it, it's becoming more and more normalized. Like, I, th- I think anymore, if someone's like, ah, safety tools, they're now the odd person out. Like most people have kind of realized the actual point of them is not to ruin your fun. And and, and if you do think that, then again, I don't want to play with you. So, yeah. And there's plenty of people out there yeah. that will still play with you. Yep. You, you can go try to disturb each other all night, whatever, Yeah, that's whatever funny. you think you find fun. Yep. Uh, so uh, speaking of Dave, actually, we got another question from the discord from Dave. This one's for you. Okay. So, Aventuria is rated uh, 7.5 with a weight of 2.4 on BoardGameGeek. How close are your personal ratings of the game to those? I gave it a 9 on BoardGameGeek. It's not perfect, but if I remember, BoardGameGeek is always willing to play, will not turn down a game. I think is 9. I'm going to double check that because I don't remember off the top of my head. (laughs) As usual for AMAs, I don't like to cheat and use the internet, but I just I need to find any <laughs> game to rate. Uh, nine is excellent. Very much enjoy playing. 
Also, oh, maybe it would be. what's a 10? Is 10 never turned it's, down again? Uh, outstanding. Uh, we'll always enjoy playing. Okay, no, I gave it a nine because there were bits that I didn't enjoy. Yep. I, I like the, 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 the minor quibble. It was just like, oh, I, that, why, why'd they do it that way? So I didn't always enjoy it 100% all the time. So that's why I gave it a nine. Right. Um, it, one of them actually says, we'll never turn down. Maybe that's like an eight. I don't even remember anymore all the numbers. So uh, eight's the one I was, eight is very good game. I like to play probably i'll suggest it and will never turn down a game oh interesting because when i hover over eight on the bgg it says very good enjoy playing and would suggest so there's they they have two different sets of ratings on their own so it's, yes number nine is excellent game always want to play it whereas 10 is outstanding always want to play and expect this will never change so bgg has two different versions of their own rating system and they yeah, wonder would, why people don't follow it I was just checking the mouse over of the actual stars and it gives it. So what I did different. is if on the, the, when you look up a page rank and you can rate it, there's right. a little eye that if you mouse over the eye says, here's a list of recommended ratings. Oh, okay. And that's what I am using. Right. So yeah, it was the, the always want to play and expect this will never change. I don't always want to play it. Right. Like, like I like it. I like it a lot. It's definitely an eight for me based on this one. I'll never turn down a game as it, if I'm using the rating as kind of, it, it, I have turned down playing it. So I can't quite say that. Right. So, but I'm like, I'm like between eight and nine, probably. So to be honest, if I'm using their rating between seven and eight sounds right. Good game, usually willing to play. I'll suggest it, but I might turn it down now and then would be like a 7.5. So right. I got to say that that fits their rating for how I feel. But I personally rate more to the eights and nines. Like the, the word never to me is a little bit much. Right. Like I, I very seldom will turn down a game. I have to be like, I'm not I'm going to turn down a game because I need to review something else or because of that. Wait, I, again, uh, with uh, Race for the Galaxy being our 2.5, I would say it's lower uh, than see, Race. Interestingly, Race right now is rated 2.99. Oh, it's jumped up. So that a shouldn't lot. be our median anymore. Race is now a 2.99. Oh, we're going to have to find a new medium. I game. know. What the heck? People are, people are finding it complicated with the newest printing, I guess. <laughs> it is a terrible game to teach. Well, there you go. Uh, let me see. So yeah, average, we'll have to find a new medium. Average, it's definitely yeah. simpler than Race for the Galaxy. They're, like, there's icons. But the icons. That is the one thing that does seem to trip players up, actually. The players seem to be tripped up by the icons. But once you play once, you get them. I'm talking about Aventuria, not Race yeah. of the Galaxy. The the lidless eye or the lit the the dark eye. I always want to call it the lidless eye, the Lord of the Rings thing, because that's what it reminds me of. Right. The dark eye symbol tends to confuse people. That's fate. And the other thing is now that we're playing some of the older adventures that were actually published for the first edition, they changed some of the icons. So the icon that is now two cross swords used to be the starburst. So that confuses players, which I didn't even, it for some reason just kind of slipped past me because I was like, I knew there was a second printing and that Forest and Overturn right. and um, Triple Lost Souls were published for the old edition because of the glossy cards and the fact that like the characters have a wheel for one, but I totally missed the fact the icons had changed. So like we were playing a game with Tori and Kat where Tori wasn't doing something because he didn't think he had the symbol. Oh, okay. And here it was just the, the generic put three tokens on a thing. Right, and they can be anything, so they change the way those tokens look. So interestingly, I'm just double checking here. Uh, the median game is yes. Legendary, a Marvel deck building game, Civil War. Well, I played Legendary because <laughs> uh, I get four games. If I if I search for games that are rated high enough, like are, are rated well, yeah. uh, and are a two point five with at least ten people suggesting the weight. Um, because you, any higher than that, you lose it mm -hmm. because nobody suggests weight. And I get four games: Legendary Expansion, Civil War, Citrus from 2013. Never played that one. Uh, <laughs> Encircle the fin uh, Ficas. Um, Unlock Mystery Adventures, Tony Powell's Treasure, and I played a single. Exit unlock. the game, Sinister Mansion. No, that wasn't the one we played. Is that? No, you did no. not do Sinister Mansion. I'm like, I don't think we played that exit game. <laughs> so exit I'm like, games like I'm putting a weight on exit games is hard. Puzzles all depend on the people doing them. Yeah, puzzles are so hard to rate a difficulty. 
So oh, math yeah. guy Dave said he asked it because he thinks it might be our game of the year. The thing is, we discovered it at Venturia last year. Yeah. Like, it isn't new to 2021 for us. True. We started playing it last year, and I think I might have put it on our best games of 2020. That is an episode we did. I don't right. remember what we said were our best games <laughs> of 2020. Yeah, definitely have to do some research before we do that again. Yeah, I would, <laughs> I would have to do some research on that. But, yeah, Venturia is really good. We've definitely been enjoying it. Um, I've enjoyed playing it four and five players. Deanna enjoy it, and I enjoy it as a date night game. One of the things that I clicked in that is so good about that game is the almost complete lack of quarterbacking because you were so focused on your own thing in your own deck. And it's not a matter of, I know what your character does. Even if it was, it's like, whatever you, I don't know what you have in your hands and I don't know that. Like, maybe it's like, oh, you should go try to take the test. But like, it, I've never had a turn where it was like, you know what you should do this turn? Use this, then use this, then use that, then do this and make this roll. Like, yes, now and then we're like, wait, no, no, no. Use your thing that might miss first so you earn some fate. But, like, that's just more tactics and strategy talk, not taking another player's turn for them. Okay. So that part's really good. Um, that roller coaster is so well done. The, the, the oh, my God, how are yeah. we going to win? Look at all these henchmen. There's no way. And then playing, like, oh, no, we're doomed. We're absolutely, look, I'm already down to 10 health. So wait, wait, no, we might be, you know what? I got some healing cards. Now that I have armor out, we might be okay. To, oh, no, no, oh, geez, if our time runs out, and then you win. Like, that happens so often with that game. But we have won, lost a couple now, so it's and, and it, so it has happened. I, I, I dig it. I, I like Adventure a lot. I think it is one of the best adventure card games i've played i'm definitely enjoying it more than the warhammer one which is surprising because the warhammer one I, to be honest if warhammer kept going if it wasn't killed after one box set maybe i'd get more into it it's more similar to that i'm enjoying it way more than the pathfinder one even though i was having fun with the pathfinder one um and honestly i think i'm enjoying it more than say descent or gloomhaven like, it's not a dungeon crawler, but it scratches that same itch. The same, I'm playing a character, I'm fighting monsters, I'm having adventures. No, I'm not putting miniatures out on a map, but it's scratching that same almost RPG itch in a better way. So I honestly think that I'm enjoying Adventuria more than most dungeon crawlers. Yeah, I, I think it was this year. Um... Was it this year? I've, See, that's it's quarantine time. I have I know, no idea. I, I know. It took us that long to get to it. Like, I remember getting the pile of stuff. When was that? Well, and then I'm just trying to find our, so our unboxing of Aventuria was March. Wow. Okay. So maybe it is this year. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I think uh, it is. It is. It might be game of the year. There you go. Oh, uh, I hate yeah. having a game of the first time we played. Oh, that's now. Was the fifth month in May. Yeah. May so, was yeah, our first play. Unboxed it in March and, and played it in May. Wow. All right. I just have no clue what year it is. <laughs> Quarantine. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Maybe it is from there. It feels like it was from last year. <laughs> it really feels like it was from last year. Well, I wonder when all that stuff showed up. Probably February. Yeah. We'd have it on an after show somewhere. Somewhere when we unbox the giant pile <laughs> of stuff. Yeah. giant box speaking of which there's unboxings for later tonight if you stick around i know what one of them is well i don't actually i know where one of them came from <laughs> is a better way to put it but yeah inventory is really good like i more people should play it we should show math guy dave how to well, play it unfortunately we need to get it out to the like we need the quarantine oh, and you know next. pandemic over <laughs> to get it out to people because not being able to buy it is problematic yes uh no i was gonna say we should show math guy dave on tabletop simulator because mm -hmm. the tabletop simulator version is really good it just that it only has one story yeah that's, that's the problem. problem and actually we haven't checked there could be more now who knows maybe they've added more. Uh, not it. according to their website oh you you can play the the druid from yeah something. they added the druid they added the druid from forest no return but they didn't add the stories which is not just the book right you need those cards out and you need right. the henchmen and you need like it's more than because at first I was like, I'll just use that and run it. But the only thing you'd be able to do is do your deck. Yeah. Everything else I'd have to somehow do here with air with I don't know down cameras. And <laughs> I could probably do it because I think that mat would fit on this table with the down air. We could probably do it, but in general, there's probably better things we can play <laughs> online that work better. There you go. Yeah, the biggest problem is getting the game, and and that's I I don't know I don't know what to tell you. That's it's been a problem. Indeed. I, I this is the problem with us putting out. I've almost kind of decided to hold off on more Aventuria content because 
I, like no one can buy this stuff and i get people writing me saying how do i get this i'm like i don't know i sorry we 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 didn't so know i just went to the publisher and they don't have anything like and so we're like, not we're not new hotness we are pre-new hotness yeah because you can't get the hotness <laughs> no like it's not even here yeah so so the the north american retailer not even on their website anymore so I don't know if, if if they're changing who's publishing their stuff in North oh. America. Like I'm on all products, newest to oldest, and it's not even here. Surprise. So I I don't know. I I reach out to Eric Simon again and say, hey, how do people buy your game? Alrighty. Well, I think we've had a good run of questions. We we did some deep dives on this stuff. We didn't no, do a bunch of good. tiny little this ones. Was... I think this was a healthy uh, a healthy discussion on all sorts of stuff. Uh, and if uh, people want to go check over check out Dyson Logos on Twitter, he posted his art for the ammo theme today. Nice. Yeah, that'd be worth checking out. So the last update was February 18th this year. It's the last time Ulysses Spiel has put out anything about Aventuria. And it was the release of the Magister of Alchemy on Tabletop Simulator. <laughs> like, that's it. That's the last update, February. Wow. Like, there, there's just nothing. There's... I don't know. I, I, I have the games. They'll be out there sometime. The, the only thing good about this is anytime you search anything, I've been sure you on the internet, we come, we come up, up. Yeah, yeah. which is kind of nice. Like we're, we're in the perfect SEO position. So if this game ever explodes, we're, we're going to be the experts on this game. Yep. But yeah, it's, it's good. It's, it's extremely solid game. Deanna has been really enjoying it. This is this, it's become our date night game of choice. You'll notice we haven't been playing the Duke and patchwork and stuff recently. We tend to sit down and play some Aventuria if we're not trying to learn something new from the pile of obligation um we honestly still have to go back and finish for us no return because we failed on that last mission we still haven't done that i just the, the sales were ridiculous they took up way too much of our time yeah for some reason I, I didn't remember it being this bad last year or maybe we were more lax about how much time we spent and like actually enjoyed life a bit in between <laughs> so i know we slept more this year like leading up to the big days we, we did more sleeping in than than before going like you know what and there's no big sales launch we're gonna sleep in and then put out some stuff and then kind of work on stuff but once we hit the the big day so the, there's your other big secret is um sleep sleep yeah no uh going back to pax's question here here here's your biggest tip for amazon is the sales go live at midnight wherever the heck they are which i think is central or pacific which is 3 a.m. Eastern. Right. So if you really want to be get there and get the hottest deals, you need to check. And and there's a little bit more to it than that that I won't share, but it's the whole early bird gets the worm thing, which we normally do not do on a regular basis. Uh, now we do have a way to check what's coming up, and we tend to know if it's worth getting up at 3 a.m. ahead of time. But that I'll leave you to discover on your own. Remember, when it's not the holidays, we like to spend this segment answering one of your game or game night questions. We usually deep dive a question instead of kind of scratching the surface on a bunch of different things. But we did get kind of deep tonight. Now, if you do have a game or game night question for us, all you got to do is head over to the website, click on the words, ask the bellhop, the top of the page, or email questions at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. So, as I've already mentioned, I have not gotten in any gaming this week, except for a couple board game arena uh, plays. Not even plays, like turns. I took a few <laughs> turns on board game arena. Though I did, Deanna did point out that uh, we tied and I ended up winning that game of uh, Zolkin. So it didn't come up for me. So I had to restart that, just because I've been enjoying playing that with Eugene. I still love that game. That and I had a long conversation in, in that last uh, in, in in the last turn there because he knew he was he was lost and we we started having uh, oh, a so long I didn't conversation. Even see the chat going on. That's cool. Yeah. So now I know you've been playing Rogue Book because uh, well you felt the need to message me about it during <laughs> the week. So why don't you share your thoughts on Rogue Book? What about a year later? I don't know. That was probably two months ago. Whatever. When did we get Rogue Book? <laughs> it's when did we six review months? that? Was that this year? Six months? Eight months? Six months ago. 
Anyway, like it's that. been a while now, so yeah, it's well past. Uh, the and they've gone thoughts. through, and they've gone through a number of updates. Uh, and the reason I started playing is because they posted an update that said they fixed a bunch of bugs. On yes. and, and, and actually, because it wasn't a major content update, I wanted to to jump back in because they had just fixed bugs. Um, so I re reinstalled it and uh, and jumped in. Uh, and they've done some some nice things. Uh, it feels very different, but I'm having trouble because I had progressed so far in the game already. I'm not sure how different it is for me compared to how different it would be to someone who's still in the early game. Right. Uh, because of the number of unlocks I have, I'm not sure um, who it's going to change more for. Uh, for me, it's pretty significantly different. Um, I, or, or at least it feels that way. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's hard to say, again, yeah, it's hard to say which is what. Uh, one nice thing that they've added, and I sent you a, a screenshot of it, is when the game is done, you get a summary screen of okay. battles won, spells cast, your entire deck, and mm -hmm. all sorts of statistics about what you've done. And we've talked before about how this is not a short game. This nope. is this is a two plus. It hour used to game. be. Yeah, it used to be a short it, game. It's a two plus hour game, so verging on three hours. Um, and when you were done, it was just done. You could yeah. go spend some spend some. Uh, some scrolls and, and upgrade something, but that was it. You won, you lost, didn't matter. It was done. Now you've got this summary screen that actually lets you feel like you've accomplished something, even if you've lost. Nice. Um, and, and there's this, this ability to analyze the game. Whereas before you would have had to remember what you right. had in your deck or what you had done and all this stuff. So this, you, you're allowed to play more methodically and more technically if that is your, um, if that is your, your theme. Uh, now the interesting thing that I found is my particular favorite combo of players, uh, there's four characters you can play. You can mm -hmm. only play with two at a time, uh, are actually the two last, the last two characters, uh, Seifer, the rat and Aurora, the turtle. Um, I just hooked up with these two, with these two characters and started liking their style of playing right. together pretty early on, actually. Um, and it matters more now. One thing I've noticed is they actually track who's, which characters you've beaten certain and combinations of characters you've beaten certain things with. Okay. To to stop you from doing this, I think <laughs> doing what I was doing, I guess. <laughs> um, and because to me, Seifer and Aurora seem way overpowered. Okay. Um, I went back in and I just because they're my favorites, I I started with them, and I burned through the entire three levels really never feeling a challenge and and almost feeling guilty that i'd burned through <laughs> everything so easily and ended mm -hmm. up with all the cards and on all the levels of card things and you know a huge giant list of gems on all my cards and all more money than i could spend and all this stuff right. um but i went back in and i went okay let's let's see if it really is if they made the game easier or what. And I went back in with the original two characters to do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And no, it was definitely those two characters because I did not finish it. Okay. Um, so there's there's definitely easier and harder ways to play the game, uh, which is nice. But You would think the starting characters would be easier than the later but it's, characters. It's interesting the that they haven't balanced the character combos yeah. very well. Um, it, 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 to me, it seems like unless it's they just fit my style that much better which awesome. is possible but uh yeah i was way more successful with those two characters than i was uh in two other games with two other pairings of characters so uh, yeah, that was... personally i haven't booted up road book in a long time like i had fun with it but once it got to be a two three hour game it lost my interest yeah i liked being able to boot it up and in an hour do a full run and maybe accomplish something. And it, it didn't give you much back then. Like it took forever. You'd have to do multiple <laughs> runs yep. to ever unlock anything. But I can sit there and when I'm working, especially like in the middle of all these deals, like that's it. I need an hour break. And I could sit down and play a game of Rogue Book and get a boat, depending on as long as I didn't lose on the first level, <laughs> which still happened now and then. Yep. You know, get half an hour to an hour's fun and then be like, done. I finished it. Now I can go back to working. There's no way I'm going to boot up new three hour Rogue Book and do that. 
Yeah. If I have three hours, I'm going to go do something else. I'll, I'll go play a board game. We'll do another Adventuria adventure or something. I'll go yeah. unbox something. Like yeah. three hours is a big amount of time for what feels like it should be a time waster. Yeah. Now, I mean, the one nice thing is because of the nature of the game, if you dump it into the background and go to work and then jump yeah. over and do something, you can play it bit by bit. But you also do sometimes uh, stand the chance of losing track of your deck. Yeah. Uh, you know, you don't. What was just, I doing? Yeah. How was I playing yeah. this deck? That was, oh, shoot. Yeah. Okay. Let's try this. Um, or, you know, where you're, what, what next cards you want, you know, that yes. sort of thing. Um, but you can play it that way. And to be fair, I have done that some. Again, I am playing while I work. And while things are a little slowed down right now, thankfully for me, thankfully. Uh, I am still, I am still working. So I am, you know, jumping over to email from, from the game now and then. But, uh, but even without that, I mean, you're absolute minimum two hour game. That if you do if you're doing well yeah so uh other than that i got uh i got something new finally uh i got claim the sky monty cookies supers game so that's so is that using cypher system this is cypher system yeah okay so, so the uh, numenera system yeah so i need to i need to dig into that and i have not i have not cracked it yet it'll be very different from anything you're used to because it's all about resource management Right. Like that is the point. Your stats, you have three stats. Your stats are your resources. You roll dice and then spend your stats to make them succeed, which is just a, a, a very <laughs> peregrine shift from most role playing games. Right. And, and first introduced to Numenera. And well, I liked it enough to become a play tester and to back the giant box set on Kickstarter, even though I was a play tester and already had a copy of the rules for free. Right. So yeah, I, I, I'm looking forward to hearing what you think of that just because it's so different. And honestly, I think it's going to be great for supers because player success is generally like success or failure is all player driven. Right. Yeah. There's a D20 there. There's still randomness. But if you really want to do the thing, you can always do the thing in Numenera right. and in the Cypher system. You can always do it. The cost might be a little more <laughs> than you want to pay, but you can always succeed if you want to. Cool. Uh, and then other than that, it's been I've done a little bit of Gilded Engineering. Uh, just again, just kind of every once in a while, open that up, like grind, like one through, grind through one map, yep. and hop out. See, that's the one that has replaced Rogue Book for me. Yeah, yeah, that's the one that I can throw on for half hour, forty five minutes. Yeah, and actually do a couple things. Like, like for forty five minutes, I'm probably going through two dungeons at least, if not three. Yeah. Whereas I've been, I've been using it as that, that go in, grab a dungeon, get out again. If I've only got a, you know, a few minutes before my next conference call, yeah. that's the game I'll sort of go to and do one quick run of. Uh, and then the other one is Mist Survival which is uh zombie horror. Uh, you're going to die. Um, it's just a matter of how long you live. Uh, you basically wake up three years after the zombie apocalypse and are in a campground area trying to uh, survive. And I'm having fun with that one. I'm just enjoying PVE survival building games. Uh, okay. The Empyrean was the sci-fi, sci-fi version. Well, Mist is the zombie version. So Okay lots of those out there yeah yeah no it's... and then like all i've been doing is bga clans of caledonia is still amazing zolkin has done really well on there though i'm still better with the physical game there's just something about the physicality and the physical pieces and having your resources in front of you that i find way easier to control in real life but i'm still doing well enough on that what i do want to comment on is Imotep because we talked about this last week and i complained about the interface well, what I didn't realize... You were doing it wrong, yeah. I, I realized Well, that not afterwards. doing it wrong, but you can do it different ways. And if you just do it the intuitive way, it actually works, and it's way better than using the menus to select everything. Yeah. So I realized once I that learned afterwards. that I can just click where I want my stone to go on the boat and click where I want the boat to go, the game got much more intuitive and less annoying to me. It, it is still better. It's still not a... No, it's, it's not a great game. BGA game, and uh, it's terrible turn-based. And officially today... Azul was released. Oh yeah, we we we've we still been playing even Azul. Finished one round yet? <laughs> yeah. but... we've been we've been playing Azul, but it wasn't officially released. I just found the link to it. Uh, but as of today, Azul became yeah, official. And it looked perfect. Like it I, does. I, I, there's nothing I can complain about in that oh, no. at all. <laughs> it, it's Azul. It's perfect. The way they even did it, so I can see all the player boards at once using the scroll wheel is really well done. Like the only thing you're missing out on is that tactile clacking physicality of the game. But at least you don't have to. At least you don't have to worry about accidentally eating the tiles or anything. Either. Yeah, you're not gonna you're not gonna <laughs> open them up. Plus, it does all the math for you, which that is the thing. Some people get screwed up on that Scrabble style scoring. It takes care of all that for you, which is awesome, and it's tracking everything. 
I, no, it's there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's it's a perfect implementation of Azul digitally, and I I don't know if it's subscriber only or anything at this point, but yeah, I, at this point everyone should just subscribe to Board Game Arena anyway. Well, no, 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 no. Remember, as uh, playing those games, as Modi jacked up the price on it. Remember? Oh, did that already happened. I thought that was oh. Yeah, no, as Modi because well, they took it over, jacked up the price. Anyway. Yeah, and I haven't seen. I haven't because I've already I paid just before it it was announced. Yeah, I'm good for a year, but next year I'm gonna have to solve sure look at pay, yeah, and have to decide if it's worth it or not. So, yeah, um, that's a, the the split it so one person in your group is sub so they can invite other. Wait till they take that away. Uh-huh. Once they take that away, I might quit. Yeah, if they take away the sub player can invite non sub players to tables, might be a bit much. All right, well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Uh, so the pile of obligation keeps growing during this. Like, I knew I signed up for stuff, and I expected it to come kind of staggered, like some possibly into the new year, and it seems like it's all piling in right now. So digging into that stuff is is going to be um, the next steps, right? So, and of course, step one to that is going to be getting it unboxed, and that's the first thing that's going to happen, and next is getting them played. So right now, the the queue for that is Quezzle, which is from Unidragon Games. This is a company that makes beautiful high-end wooden puzzles that are not cheap, I will fully admit, but they are beautiful, uh, with shaped pieces. Like, I guess when you finish every puzzle, you'll have pieces left that you can make a toy out of. Like they, It looks like they do some really neat stuff. Um, the thing that they're releasing with Quezzle is that they have taken their puzzles and put quests in them, thus Quezzle, quest puzzle. So there's a game element where I, I, I honestly don't know exactly what they did, they did with it, but supposedly there's like mysteries and clues and some kind of puzzle to solve. So I need to unbox those and then I'm looking forward to playing them with the kids because what I actually have is a four pack of these. And again, I haven't unboxed it yet. So it's, I think they're four separate games, but they might even tell an ongoing story. So I'm really looking forward to what they did to jigsaw style puzzles to make them a game. Fair enough. Next, I want to get Doodle Dungeon done and Disney Sidekicks. Those are two of the um, the big ones I want to get off the pile of shame and get out there. Um, new people we're working with in those cases. Plus, they look like the. I don't think it's going to take weeks to play, right? It's not going to be a. We're going to be able to figure those out pretty quickly. Versus, say, Land versus Sea, which has taken us some time to get to the point where we're comfortable reviewing it because we want to try all the different player accounts and all the different scoring options. Well, I have a feeling Doodle Dungeon is going to be pretty straightforward. And from what I'm hearing about Disney sidekicks, this is really hard and highly random, but I am still looking forward to finding out exactly what Eric Lang has done in the world of Disney. Now, Deanna and I may also get the Alchemist Hero Pack for Adventuria played. Um, and then I may also do some inventory unboxings, as at this point, once we play that, we will have played everything we've opened so far. So it's kind of time for new stuff. But we do still have to go back to Forest No Return and try to finish that third fight. But at this point, we've, we've looked at everything. We've touched everything. We've seen it all. So it's time to get some more Adventuria stuff out there. And maybe someday, somewhere, you'll be able to buy this stuff too. So, I, so we'd be opening that mainly for our sake at this point because we want more Adventuria experience. I know Tori and Kat are already like, we want to try more. Speaking of Tori and Kat, um, we do have plans to game on Friday now that things have died done, down. So that'll be nice actually getting to physical gaming again. Um, we're going to be trying a DIY do-it-yourself ramen kit from a company out of Kitchener, Ontario, who also has a location in Guelph. And I'm really looking forward to reviewing that ramen as well. I know Sean's looking forward to hear about it as well because it's, I think Guelph's actually closer to you than it is to me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it, it's actually closer to home for him. And I got to say, it showed up today and just the packaging was awesome. So um, I don't think I've shared that anywhere publicly yet. I was going to say check my Twitter, but I haven't actually shared those pictures. They were shared in some Facebook chats. Now, games I have queued up, but I haven't made any decisions yet as I've read the rules for Terror Below, which is the, um, what is that? Tremors board game, the Tremors board game. You play Kevin Costner, I guess, um, where you're driving around a Jeep and collecting, um, I don't know, sandworm eggs um spell smashers which is one that we actually had on our word-based party game list as a um honorable mention because it sounded cool because this is a word-based game where you are spelling words to do damage to monsters and when you kill them you get the monster card as a new like letter in your deck 
what I had no clue of is this is not a deck builder. So this is not, um, this is not a, a, a version of paperback or hardback. This is not, a, you're not going to have a deck of words. It's more like Scrabble in the fact that every turn you're going to draw more letter cards to your hand. Mm -hmm. So that's a very different feel from the other word games we've been playing. So I'm looking forward to checking that out. I've got a game called Scurvy Dice, which is, uh, you know, Pirates Meet Yahtzee, but it's about you roll your dice to build your ship. And each different side on the die is a different part of your ship. So like sails help you move, hull helps you defend, cannons help you attack, cutlasses help you board. Um, and there's something else. There's parrots that are wild, I think, and I, I still might be missing one side. So you roll all your dice and you can re-roll once to build your ship and then you then compete your ships against the other player's ships. Where it's like everyone moves, everyone shoots at each other, then everyone does boarding actions, then everyone moves down the map, and then whoever moved fastest gets their first pull of the treasure. It looks really neat. It looks like a nice light uh, filler game. It's got an awesome cloth map, and then um, like laser cut little ships that all look unique. It looks well done for an indie game. Now this is, I can't remember who publishes it, but it's it's was a Kickstarter that's now out there in the world. So I'm looking forward to checking that out. Um, just to note, none of those are Pile of Obligation. That's all stuff off the Pile of Shame I want to play. Then finally, we might, and I, and I big might, get Charterstone to the table for the start that off. But I think we're going to wait till next week. Like, I think this week's just going to be kind of let's relax, play some games. We've had a stressful week. Not let's sit down and dive into this new Legacy game. I'm just not feeling that right now. Maybe I'll change my mind by Friday. For one, I'll have to unbox it before then. So that's got to happen. Um, and then, well, there's the stuff I want to unbox, right? So the Quezzle in that, I think I'm going to play with the kids. But I think um, the the Dungeon Roller, the, I already forgot the name, even though it's right up here somewhere. The Dungeon Thing, what is it called? Spell Smashers. Spell, no, no, no. The the Dungeon Draw, Roll and Write. Oh, yes. Uh, doodle, doodle, dungeon. doodle Dungeon. There we go. Doodle Dungeon. I think Doodle Dungeon's one that Tori and Cat will enjoy. So Or Disney Sidekicks. We might get those out. I don't know if we are supposed to be handing over to Brenda and Holly's. Um, so that might get tossed in there too. Anyway, um, the other thing, you and I, and at some point D, need to sit down and play some land versus C because I don't want to promise anything because who knows what's going on right now. But I am really expecting, I plan on reviewing that during next week's show next Wednesday or next Tuesday if you're listening. So we are hoping to get the land versus sea down, but Sean needs to play this thing because I want to be able to hear his opinions on it as well as just mine. And now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Brian Van Beek. Thanks to one of our many Brian's. Diane Tuzano. Thanks ma. The misdirected Mark podcast still recording live here on Twitch on Tuesday nights, though they are smarter than us and taking a break over November. Lucas, thank you. Joe Swick. Thanks, Joe. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to drop that portcullis. Well, the doors to the lobby are closed. You can always find us all over the web at Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. Now, the one thing you can also do that I would love oh so much so that this season doesn't get so stressful every year so we can move away from affiliate links and start making money a different way would be for you to support us through our Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. By supporting us through Patreon, you get awesome stuff like usually at least an hour, sometimes two hours of bonus content, bonus audio that you only get through there unless you happen to join us live and for all our shows. Even then, you don't get the pre-show, even if you're here live. So you get stuff that no one else has heard. Um, sometimes I'll send out a free game that I designed. I've done that recently. More importantly, you get to join the awesome people on our Discord channel where we chat games and gamings and sometimes play games together. I think that's actually the biggest selling point of our Patreon, but there are others. And if you back at the right level, we'll even play games with you online. All right. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the Pedo Suite for the after show and stop by Sundays on YouTube for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you.
and game on.